guess you, you guys, um, most people know what myeloproliferative neoplasms are. They used to be called myeloproliferative disorders. They're grouped, what we call phenotypically. So they're, they're basically the diseases of too many cells. So um, they, are, they are officially blood cancers, and that's because they're clonal. That means they come, they're all the one type of cell. And the characteristic of these particular type of uh, uh, neoplasms or cancers is that they're a proliferation of mature cells and they're any type of the myeloid blood cells, so that is red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. Um, this is a blood film that we typically see. Um, uh, so too many uh, red blood cells, we have too many platelets, which are these little spotty things. And not only do we have too many white blood cells, but we have immature white blood cells in the, in the peripheral blood. And so this is a myelofibrosis blood film. And this is a patient uh, from the internet with uh, myelofibrosis who has very big liver, very, very big spleen, and a lot of muscle wasting, and, and this is a sort of very advanced picture of myelofibrosis. So the different, uh, as I said, the different types of myeloproliferative neoplasms are all about the too many diseases. So we have too many white blood cells in chronic myeloid leukemia, too many red blood cells is polycythemia vera, too many platelets in the central thrombocythemia. And then there's lots of other sort of funny myeloid cells, so mast cells, which leads to mastocytosis. It's officially a myeloproliferative neoplasm as well. But what they're all linked by is that they're linked by this you know, too many idea. They're linked by the fact that they have a risk of transformation either to myelofibrosis or acute leukemia. And they're linked by the fact that they actually start right back here so even though we see too many mature blood cells, they're actually linked because they're actually caused by a point mutation in a gene that in the stem cell population that causes these cells to grow too fast and actually make too many of these cells down, downstream. So just to quickly mention chronic myeloid leukemia, and then I'll, I won't mention it again. This is uh, one of the first blood cancers to really, un people understand how it works. So, it works because of this gene called BCR-ABL, and this is two different chromosomes, and they're put together. And so ABL is a gene that's in every cell in the body, and it tells the cell to grow. And BCR is, in fact, part of, it's a breakpoint cluster region, and what it means is it, it's, a, it's a highly amplified gene, and it's associated with immune signaling. But what you basically have here is a highly amplified gene that's put next to a gene that tells the cell to grow. And so what you lead to is this uncontrolled growth, and it causes what we call a fusion oncogene, um, and that is just constantly turned on, and it constantly tells the cell to grow. And what we know now is that this works by this little active pocket here in the enzyme, and that can be blocked with drugs like Gleevec or Imatinib. And by doing that in, in chronic myeloid leukemia, you take patients with these very high white blood cell counts, you put them on the medication, within a month, the blood counts go down low. Most people stay, um, and so this tells you how many patients progress or have any problems at all. And so now we know that sort of 95% of patients can be treated with just one tablet a day. And so it's really, uh, I guess, the outstanding success story in all of cancer. Um, because by understanding how the disease works, uh, people were then able to develop a targeted therapy and actually turn off that gene. And, uh, and, and uh, most patients now have a really excellent outcome. Patients who get out here at five years are very likely then to go on to 10 years and beyond, uh, stable on that same therapy. So I'll talk about the other myeloproliferative neoplasms now. So really, ET and polycythemia vera, we characterize by an increased risk of clotting or bleeding, a lot of constitutional symptoms. And then the constitutional symptoms, we mean things like fatigue, pruritus, night sweats. So pruritus is itch, sweats, um, bone pain, fevers, weight loss. And so a lot of these sort of general symptoms that people think, oh, hang on a second, I'm going crazy. What's this? You know, I'm itching all the time. Every time I get out of the shower, I'm itching. These are all caused by, in fact, abnormal cytokines, so abnormal inflammation in the body, and that's caused by the actual myeloproliferative neoplasms. As I said, there's a risk of transformation to myelofibrosis and acute myeloid leukemia. And myelofibrosis often presents with increasing size of the spleen and then a reduction in the other blood counts. So either the platelet count uh, causing bleeding or anemia requiring transfusions and um, infections caused by low white blood cell counts. There's also obviously the symptoms of MPN now are actually, uh, a lot of the symptoms we have to deal with in patients are actually caused by the treatment that we give patients. So either chemotherapy or steroids or other targeted therapies that actually cause symptoms in itself. And so we have to uh, work out how to deal with those particular 
So just to sort of get on target here, so these are the current list of treatments in MPN. But I'm actually going to start at the bottom and then sort of cover a few of the more common things that we do. So I'll start at the bottom because the JAK2 inhibitors are really what everybody knows about now in myeloproliferative neoplasms. But we only use these drugs in a very small fraction of patients. And that's because they're very expensive drugs. They're drugs that have um, significant side effects and they're drugs that are not the same as Gleevec in a chronic myeloid leukemia. So they don't switch off the disease and basically you're fine there. They're, they're, it's actually much more complicated than that. So I'll come back to some of these other ones in a second, but I'll just talk a little bit about JAK2 because that's really where the myeloproliferative story changed completely. So in 2005, uh, a number of groups, uh, including one of the labs I trained in overseas, discovered that there was these point mutations in JAK2. And JAK2 is very interesting because it's just like that ADL that you find in chronic myeloid leukemia. It's a tyrosine kinase. And the job of tyrosine kinase is to tell a cell to grow. And so this is actually a point mutation, so just one amino acid, just one point in the gene. And in fact, what it does is it inactivates the part of the gene that normally inactivates itself. And so it removes its ability to turn itself off, so it's constantly on, if that makes sense. And so what we say that causes is ligand independent activation. And I'll show you what that means in a second. And it's found in almost every single patient with polycythemia vera. And in fact, if we can't find it in somebody with polycythemia vera, we, we question ourselves whether it really is polycythemia vera. Um, it's found in about half of everybody else with myeloproliferative neoplasms. And at that stage, it was the first recurrent mutation found in patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms. But since then, we've been able to find other uh, mutations in other patients as well. And so these are the big three. So JAK2, B617F, and that just says it's valine to phenylalanine at 0.617. So it just describes what the mutation is. This is MPL, and MPL is a thrombopoietin receptor. So thrombopoietin is basically the platelet growth factor. And it's not surprisingly, it's found most commonly in this condition here with too many platelets or myelofibrosis again. And CAVR, which is the newest cue on the block, and it's still being worked out to some extent, but it also leads to activation of the same pathway. And so between these three, the vast, vast majority of patients with MPN have one of these three. And, uh, you know, we, we probably have a dozen patients at Royal Brisbane Hospital who have true MPN who don't have one of those three mutations. It's actually quite rare. In these other rare disorders, there's actually a bunch of other mutations as well. So this is a platelet-derived growth factor. This is KIT, which is stem cell growth factor, um, and mutations or fusions in JAK2. But these are all tyrosine kinase mutations, so they all work the same way. They all turn on signaling. They all make the cell grow. And so just to show you schematically what that actually means, is this is the surface of the cell. This is the nucleus of the cell. And so what happens, JAK2 sits here, and this is a receptor. And this receptor might be erythropoietin, thrombopoietin, or interleukin-3. But these are all growth factor receptors. And usually what happens is one of these proteins comes along the cytokine, and it turns on this signaling. And so what we say is that it activates JAK-STAT signaling. And it turns on these downstream pathways that cause, that go into the nucleus. They turn on a large number of genes, and they cause the cell to grow. Now, this is normal JAK-2. But when you have JAK-2 V617F, Basically, the difference, as you can see, is you don't need the external stimulus to turn it on. It's on all the time. And so these pathways are constantly on. And so these cells, these myeloid cells, are growing all the time. And the reason this happens in a myeloid cell and not in other cells is because it requires this what we call scaffold. So it requires that growth factor receptor to be there to be able to be turned on. And these growth factor receptors are specific for um, myeloid cells. So you, you need the right soil to be there, and then you need the right downstream signaling cascade. But obviously, once they found this, they wanted to know, well, can we just turn off this jack signaling, and will everything get better? So that's exactly the same as the sort of paradigm in chronic myeloid leukemia. And so that's where the JAK2 inhibitors come in. They started a number of studies on it, but the big two studies were called the comfort studies, and these were used in um, myelofibrosis. So just to give you an idea about how it works, uh, this is the drug INC, INCBT424, 
which is now known as Jacobi or Axolitnib. Um, and it was initially marketed by Insight and then bought by Novartis here. And so they took patients with myelofibrosis and they said, you can either have uh, ruxolitinib or Jacobi or, or placebo, so, so nothing. A tablet looks the same, doesn't do anything. And Comfort 2 was basically the same design, only they offered patients either the active drug or best available therapy. And what best available therapy means is hydroxyurea and whatever else we want to use to control the disease. So there's slightly different trials, but the bottom line is that this is the one Australia participated in. This is basically the European trial, so US and Australia and European. And they had around about similar numbers, you know, two to 300 patients. And they powered the study to look at the reduction in spleen volume. Um, and that's been, I guess, one of the criticisms of the study, at least from my point of view, is that nobody really cares about spleen volume. What we want to know is, you know, who's going to live longer, who's going to control blood counts, and um, you know who's going to sort of feel better on the on the drug. So um, the inclusion criteria are those patients with high risk myelofibrosis. And if if you're a hematologist, you recognise these criteria because this is the criteria by which the government funds the drug now. So. If you wonder why you've got to have certain criteria, it's because that's what you had to have to get into the study. So you have to have high risk disease, and that means you have to have two or more of these, so either age greater than 70, 65, anemia, very high white cell count, very high immature blood cells in the peripheral blood, lots of symptoms. And if you had two or more of these, you could go into the trial, and uh, that would put you at intermediate two or high risk. And um, and the reason they chose this, this stratification is because this has been shown to predict patients who are likely to go on and run into trouble with either leukemia or, or um, overall survival. And this is what the actual study showed. So, um, as I said, they wanted to know whether it reduced the spleen size, and it did. And so, this is the percentage of patients who had a reduction in spleen size. So about 50% of patients have a reduction in spleen size. And uh, don't worry too much about this, actually. But um, what was also very important, yeah, so this is the actual spleen volume reducing in the ruxolitinib, not reducing in the placebo arm. But what they found that was very interesting is this graph here. So this is about the symptoms. And so this is how you started along this dotted line here. And if you've got no treatment, this is your symptoms after a while. So the symptoms actually get worse over time, which is what we know happens. If you got the drug, the symptoms improve over time. And around about 30 to 40% of patients improve their symptoms over time on that treatment. And that might be sore tummies, uh, uh, pain under the left ribs, itch, bone pain, just general fatigue and inactivity. So lots of different symptoms, but they all seem to improve. And we see this in patients on ruxolitinib. Some patients just get a dramatic improvement. Some patients get no benefit at all. Um, so the Comfort 2 study, as I said, was designed against other active therapy rather than against the placebo, but it showed the same thing. Again, about 30% of patients had a, a dramatic reduction in spleen size, and again, probably 20, 30, 40% of patients had an improvement in their symptoms. Um, and again, the, the average change in spleen size, average change in symptoms. Everybody who got the best available therapy generally got worsening of their symptoms. So even all those other things that we give usually don't really improve the symptoms of disease. And so based on this, predominantly, the drug got licensed in America. So um, the two efficacies were reduce spleen size and um, make you feel better. Um, as you know, it took quite a long time to get licensed in Australia. And really, uh, um, it's not clear how influential these data were but because the study wasn't designed to ask whether it improves survival. But over a number of years, so this is two years here, um, this is, uh, I believe, out to sort of three years here, you see the curve start to change. And what is what we call a Kaplan-Meier curve. And this is 100, at the top of the curve, it's 100% of patients alive. And so what you can see is that if you've got the ruxolitinib um, or the, the Jacobi, you are slightly more likely to um, still be alive at the end of the study than patients who didn't get the Ruxolitinib. And so based on that, that was very powerful to say that it, 
it may actually improve survival, although it's not quite clear how it improves survival. Remembering this is only in patients with high risk myelofibrosis. This is not in everybody with myelofibrosis. And so they've now gone and done a series of trials called the RESPONSE trials, which is the next step now, saying, so we know it works in high-risk myeloproliferative, sorry, high-risk myelofibrosis. Does it work in essential thrombocythemia? Does it work in polycythemia? And so the RESPONSE trials are, um, is RESPONSE 1 and RESPONSE 2. RESPONSE 1 is the trial for patients with polycythemia and a big spleen. RESPONSE 2 is polycythemia and not a big spleen. And um, both of these studies have been uh, run out of Royal Brisbane as well as elsewhere. And what they showed is that, again, patients with symptoms on ruxolinib felt a lot better on these trials. In addition to that, a lot of patients found their blood counts normalised on, uh, on the treatment compared to the patients who didn't receive treatment. But when they look at overall, it didn't appear to make any difference to patients who progressed to myelofibrosis or acute leukemia on this study. And so there's no survival difference in polycythemia vera, and we still don't really know what the role is in polycythemia vera. It is licensed in America for high-risk polycythemia. It's not licensed in Australia for high-risk polycythemia. It's not funded in Australia. So that's kind of where the JAK2 inhibitors are. There's been a bunch of other JAK2 inhibitors, so one called Fedratnib, that was pulled um, globally because it caused um, some problems with patients' uh, brain function, and that was deemed by the FDA to be a non-safe drug, so the drug got removed. There's other drugs that are in trial, so things like Momolodnib, but none of those are licensed at the moment here. And so there's a number of JAK2 inhibitors coming to, through, but really Ruxolitinib's the only one that we have access to in any patients at the moment. So I thought maybe what I'd just do is actually go back to the start and say, why do we do all these things? So particularly aspirin, venesection, hydroxyurea. So when you come in with a, with a myeloproliferative neoplasm, the first thing we always do is we put people on aspirin, we take blood off if they've got high blood counts, and we often, if people are high risk, we put people on hydroxyurea. And a lot of people don't really know why we do that. It's just something we've always done. So, um, why do we venesect in, in polycythemia? And it's based on this one big study and a lot of uh, studies back in the past suggesting there may be a benefit. But basically what it shows is they took patients with polycythemia and they said, you can have, you have to be kept with a hematocrit at less than 45% and everybody else can go 45 to 50%. So that's the low group and the high group. And this is uh, cardiac, uh, so cardiac events and cardiac plus mortality. And you can see that this is, again, the survival curve. You can see that those patients who are maintained with a low hematocrit, so regular venesections and really controlled closely, survive better and are much less likely to have a heart attack or stroke than those everybody else. So based on this study um, is really why we venesect patients and, and make sure we're really very careful about keeping that in polycythemia, keeping that controlled. Why do we use aspirin? So this is called the ECLAP study. This is an older study. But basically, again, there was a number of studies done in patients with polycythemia. Initially, patients were treated with very high dose aspirin. And that study was stopped because it, it caused a lot of bleeding. And so now, for a, a long time, people didn't know whether aspirin was beneficial or not. But this is a study done with low dose aspirin, so a mini aspirin or a quarter of an aspirin. And as you can see here, uh, overall survival, event-free survival, and cardiac-specific survival, so free of heart attack, stroke, and death from cardiovascular cause, is much, you do much better again here, much closer to 100% than the placebo group. The difference is only a few percent, it's only four or five percent difference, but that's still a very significant finding. And so that's why we treat everybody with aspirin, blood control. And then finally, why do we use um, hydroxyurea? And so hydroxyurea uh, is quite controversial. Initially, patients, uh, initially people thought maybe it increases patients' risk of leukemia. But when they went back and looked at that study, they found that in fact the only patients with an increased risk of leukemia were those patients who had previously received other treatments as well. So in fact, we think it's a very safe drug. And when we combine it with aspirin, versus another uh, type of treatment called a negrolide. 
which actually controls platelets equivalently, so the blood counts look exactly the same. There's uh, a significantly improved um, risk of, of heart attacks and strokes and survival in those patients who get hydria compared to a necrolite alone. So, and there was no risk of uh, leukemia in those studies. So based on this and the other two studies is why we give everybody aspirin, hydroxyurea, if it can be tolerated, and uh, we try to control the blood counts the best possible. And so I guess this, I wanted to just to sort of mention interferon because a lot of people who would have been reading on the internet, I know a lot of you guys read on the internet, you might have heard of interferon alpha. Now there's two types of interferon alpha, there's regular interferon alpha, and that is licensed and that is PBS funded um, for patients with high platelet counts in myeloproliferative neoplasms. And then there's pegylated interferon. Now, pegylated interferon is the new sort of version of it. It is much better tolerated and it's a once weekly injection rather than a three or four times a week injection. Now, the original studies with interferon worked in patients with ET and polycythemia, but so few patients could tolerate it because it makes you feel like you've got influenza. It makes you feel like you've got the flu all the time and you feel really sick. So um, there was actually a reasonably small number of patients actually able to tolerate the drug, so it just wasn't felt to be viable uh, in most patients. But the pegylated version, the new version, is much better tolerated and, and we find that probably about 30 to 40% of patients can actually tolerate it over the long term, which tells you how difficult the initial one was to tolerate. Um, um, but anyway, we find that patients who are able to tolerate treatment with the new long-acting version, almost all of them have a, what we call a hematologic response, which means all their blood counts come back to normal. <coughs> we find that a significant proportion of those patients reduce the amount of the cancer cell in their blood, the JAK2, um, in particular, which is the easiest one to monitor. And in about 30% of patients, we find that those leukemia cells actually completely disappear from their blood, from patients' blood. But it doesn't work until you've had at least six months of therapy. In fact, most people require 12, 18, 24 months of therapy. So it's a very slow-acting uh, medication. And we think this is because it actually acts on those stem cells that cause the disease to get rid of them gradually over time and gradually getting rid of those cells out of the blood. And whether this actually equals a cure in this disease, it, 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 it may be associated with that in a very small number of patients, um, but we think in the majority of patients it's actually just controlling that stem cell population from, uh, from proliferation. And so this is just uh, some pictures from some studies in interferon just showing you how it works. And so, again, this is a polycythemia diabetes study, this is an ET study, pegylated interferon, you can see that 70% and 80% of patients have a complete hematologic response, which means all the blood counts go back completely to normal. And this shows you over time how that happens, and it shows you that it's sort of, you need at least three months and certainly six to 12 months before you can really be confident that it's gonna work or not. This is one of the very early studies, but this is where they're measuring that JAK2 in the blood, and what they found, and they just show the ones that work here, so don't think that everybody's like this, but they can show that in a few patients, either who start with low levels, so 10% of JAK2, or very high levels, 75% of JAK2, that over time, some of those patients who responded got rid of those abnormal JAK2 cells out of their blood. And that was really the first sign that maybe this was something completely different, something special in these diseases. And as you can see, over time, if you look at the average, the average number of patients at the start is about 50%. The average percentage of uh, JAK2 after 12 months is about 20, 25%. So it does reduce. The effects are not anything like that chronic myeloid leukemia. Uh, we're not seeing the reduction to zero in the vast majority of patients. We're seeing a reduction over time that is predictable but not as uh, impressive as that. Um, importantly, no randomized studies have been done with interferon versus ruxolitinib. No randomized studies have been done with interferon versus hydroxyurea. And this is part of the reason why this is not funded by the government uh, in Australia. So if you want to get a hold of uh, interferon, you can get a hold of the old form of interferon, but you can't get a hold of the pegylated interferon uh, unless you're prepared to pay for the drug. So um, 
I guess I just put up one slide to show you some of the stuff we do in the lab. But this is from a few years ago now. We did this work sort of three or four years ago in the lab. But what we find is when we generate a, a model of, uh, of cholecythemia vera and treat with interferon, you can see that the blood counts, this is the hematocrit, 80% down to sort of 50, 60%. And in fact, that's only after four weeks in this situation. And after eight weeks, it gets completely normalized. The white cell counts come back to normal. The spleen size comes back to normal with interferon. And uh, I haven't shown you all the information here, but we can actually look in these models at the stem cell populations and show that those stem cells are actually being depleted uh, in B-bone. So we, we published that, and we're hoping to get uh, some of the companies to, to come on board and, and design clinical trials based around this. But, Unfortunately, uh, the, the companies that supply uh, the drugs that are useful for um, polycythemia and myelofibrosis haven't been able to sponsor any uh, um, investigator-initiated trials. They've sponsored their company trials, but not investigator-initiated trials yet in Australia, um, at least the ones we've proposed. So we think interferon is particularly useful. It takes these stem cell populations that drive the disease, and it pushes them into sort of more mature cells. And as they become more mature, they actually die in the circulation. And what we're not sure is whether it actually can help prevent uh, myelofibrosis and leukemia, but we uh, certainly would like to know how that happens over time. So just to show you again, and then, so these are really the, the treatments that are available for patients with uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms. And negrolide, I uh, haven't really spoken about. It's not funded by the government. It is funded by some of the public hospitals, and so we, we do have access to treat patients with this drug, and this is really used for patients who are unable to be controlled with the standard therapies, such as hydroxyurea. And then additional things here, like danazole, which is a type of steroid, or, or prednisone, having the spleen taken out, thalidomide, lenalidomide, these are really experimental sort of therapies that may work in some patients, but it's very difficult to know how likely they are to work. I haven't put up bone marrow transplant here. Obviously, bone marrow transplant is something that people uh, occasionally receive for uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms, but it, it is uh, becoming increasingly uncommon now that these sort of newer agents are available for disease. So I'm going to just have a chance to take some questions, I hope. Um, but what I wanted to say is this, is this is part of my research lab, this is everybody in the research lab. We have a lot of collaborators here at Harvard where I trained, overseas in Germany, Denmark, um, interstate Melbourne and Adelaide. And um, a lot of the work I've done has been funded by the NHMRC. Um, in the past we've been very fortunate to receive funding from the Leukemia Foundation. And without the Leukemia Foundation I wouldn't have been able to come back from overseas and actually set up a lab. But it's, it is becoming harder and harder to, uh, to get funding uh, apart from an HMRC funding in Australia. And so there's really, uh, uh, I think there's a real crisis in, in medical research funding in Australia at the moment. It's not something that has been brought up at the election, unfortunately. But um, the funding rates at the NHMRC level have actually more than halved since I got home, um, which is only five years ago. And the funding from it, other agencies has dramatically dropped as well. So it becomes harder and harder to do that laboratory research we need to do to actually understand how these drugs might work in patients. So um, I'll stop there and maybe take some questions and uh, I'm very grateful for uh,